this video, we're going to cover the regulation of glycogen synthesis and degradation. So by the end of this video, you'll understand the overview picture of how glycogen synthesis and degradation are integrated, the key enzymes involved, and how they are regulated allosterically and hormonally. And then we're going to zoom out to see the regulation of carbohydrate metabolism in the liver. So let's begin this lecture by drawing the glycogen synthesis and degradation pathway. In glycogen synthesis, we start off with glucose. Glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate by hexokinase. So we've added a phosphate group onto that 6-carbon. Then it's converted to glucose 1-phosphate by phosphoglucoremutase, and this reaction is reversible. Glucose 1-phosphate then becomes UDP glucose by the action of UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. Then glycogen synthase elongates the glycogen chain and we form glycogen. Now when we break down glycogen, glycogen phosphorylase breaks the alpha 1,4 linkages, forming glucose 1-phosphate, and the phosphoglucoremutase reaction is reversible, so glucose 1-phosphate is converted back to glucose 6-phosphate, and then glucose 6-phosphate is converted to glucose by glucose 6-phosphatase. Wow, look at that beautiful and simplified pathway. So the key enzymes involved in these pathways are glycogen synthase and glycogen phosphorylase. So now let's subtract complexity by first taking a look at glycogen mobilization and how glycogen phosphorylase is regulated. There are two forms of glycogen phosphorylase. Phosphorylase A, which is the active form, and phosphorylase B, which is the less active form, or you can say inactive, so it doesn't confuse you. So during rest, glycogen phosphorylase is in its less active form, phosphorylase B. But when there is increased muscular activity, such as when you're exercising, the hormone epinephrine will activate the phosphorylation process of phosphorylase B and convert it to its active form, phosphorylase A. The enzyme catalyzing this phosphorylation process is phosphorylase B kinase. So it's going to transfer phosphate groups to the SIR residue of phosphorylase, which converts it to phosphorylase A, the active form. And we need 2 ATP in this reaction. Now I mentioned epinephrine activates this process, but another hormone called glucagon also activates this process. Glucagon is secreted when glucose availability is low, so it's going to trigger glycogen mobilization, the breakdown of glycogen. So glucagon, glucose is gone. So how does epinephrine or glucagon trigger this process? Let's break this down. When epinephrine or glucagon binds to specific surface receptors, it's going to activate a GTP binding protein. Now, glucagon acts only on hepatocytes as muscles lack the receptors for glucagon. So when these hormones activate a GTP binding protein, ATP is going to come here and produce cyclic AMP, which is an intracellular second messenger, okay, cyclic AMP. So then the concentration of cyclic AMP is going to increase, and it's going to trigger protein kinase A. And protein kinase A is a cyclic AMP, and protein kinase A is cyclic AMP dependent. So protein kinase will then activate phosphorylase B kinase which will then convert phosphorylase B, the less active form, to phosphorylase A, the active form. And phosphorylase A, or simply just glycogen phosphorylase, will then break down glycogen. This is significant in muscle to support muscle contraction, and this is triggered by epinephrine. And in liver, we mobilize glycogen to maintain blood glucose levels, and this is triggered by glucagon. Because remember, glucagon acts only on hepatocytes because muscle lack the receptors for glucagon. So glycogen phosphorylase is activated by glucagon, epinephrine, and it's going to be triggered by increased concentration of AMP, which is the product of ATP breakdown. Because increased AMP reflects the energy state of the cell, signaling that we have low ATP levels. So we need to activate and stimulate the pathways that produces energy. So in this case, glycogen mobilization. Another substrate is calcium for muscle contraction, and it's going to bind 
to phosphorylase B kinase to trigger the phosphorylation of phosphorylase B to A, activating it. So if these are the activators, what inhibits phosphorylase? When ATP levels are increased, it's going to inhibit phosphorylase. More specifically, it's going to block the allosteric site where AMP binds to. Because when our ATP levels are high, the cells are signaling like, hey, our energy requirements are being met. We have sufficient energy available. So we don't need to break down glycogen to produce more energy because we're good, okay? Our energy requirements are being met. And so when glycogen mobilization, when glycogen mobilization is not required and our blood glucose levels are normal, we're going to convert phosphorylase A back to phosphorylase B. And this is catalyzed by the enzyme phosphoprotein phosphatase. So we're going to remove the phosphate group, okay? We're going to convert it to phosphorylase B, and we do this by adding water. Okay, so now let's summarize how glycogen phosphorylase is regulated by stepping back and, look at the, and looking at the overview picture. So it's regulated hormonally by phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. The dephosphorylated is the inactive form or less active form, and phosphorylated is the active form, and it's also regulated allosterically. So when the blood glucose levels drop, glucagon is secreted, and it's going to activate this whole process. It's going to activate phosphorylase B kinase, which then converts phosphorylase B, the inactive form, to phosphorylase A, the active form, which will then break down glycogen to release free glucose and increase glucose levels again. And when blood glucose is at a normal level, glucose will bind to an inhibitory, inhibitory allosteric site on phosphorylase A and dephosphorylate the phosphorylase, converting it to its inactive form. Okay, so now let's move to the next key enzyme in glycogen synthesis, glycogen synthase. So similar to glycogen phosphorylase, Glycogen synthase also has a phosphorylated form and dephosphorylated form. Glycogen synthase A is the active form and it's dephosphorylated, so it doesn't have phosphate groups. And the inactive form is glycogen synthase B, which is phosphorylated, so we have the phosphate groups here. The enzyme converting glycogen synthase B to glycogen synthase A is phosphoprotein phosphate 1, or PP1 for short and it's going to remove the phosphate groups. And the enzyme that converts glycogen synthase to its inactive form is glycogen synthase kinase 3. So let's go through what triggers the activation of phosphoprotein phosphate 1 to activate glycogen synthase A. So you have insulin, because insulin is secreted when there is excess glucose, and so the cells take up glucose and convert it to glycogen for storage. We have glucose glucose will trigger this reaction as well because there will be an increase in glucose transport and we're going to stimulate hexokinase and also glucose 6-phosphate. So when we have high levels of insulin, glucose, and glucose 6-phosphate, we're going to be activating and triggering PP1 to activate glycogen synthase A so that we can create glycogen, so that we can synthesize glycogen for storage. And the inhibitors are glucagon and epinephrine. So glucagon signals that glucose levels are low, and so the body needs to produce glucose by mobilizing glycogen. So glycogen synthase A will be inactivated, because when we secrete glucagon, glucose is gone. Okay, so we have low availability of glucose, so instead of synthesizing glycogen for storage, glucagon is going to be stimulating glycogen breakdown so that we can increase glucose levels again. So putting this into context, after we eat a carbohydrate-rich meal, our blood glucose increases, and this will trigger the secretion of insulin. So glucose is taken up by the cell and converted to glucose 6-phosphate by hexokinase, and then it's going to be converted to glucose 1-phosphate and then UDP glucose where glycogen synthase will facilitate glycogen synthesis. So insulin will trigger glucose uptake, hexokinase activity, and activate glycogen synthase. 
So insulin will inhibit and inactivate GSK3 and activate PP1 to activate glycogen synthase A. And on the other hand, PP1 will inactivate glycogen phosphorylase to prevent the mobilization of glycogen. Okay, so now let's combine this with glycogen phosphorylase and simplify it. Okay, so glycogen synthase is activated by glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, and insulin. So that is how the key enzymes are regulated. But now let's zoom out and look at how carbohydrate metabolism is regulated when we're at a high blood glucose state and low blood glucose state. So let's take all the concepts we've discussed in carbohydrate metabolism and integrate it all together. And we're going to be focusing on the liver because there are some differences in metabolic regulation between skeletal muscle and liver. So we're just going to focus on the liver here. Let's take a look at high blood glucose conditions first. So after a rich carb meal, insulin will be secreted to signal to the cell there is excess glucose. The cell is going to respond by taking up glucose. In liver, glucose will be transported through GLUT2 transporters and undergo oxidation via glycolysis, so glycolysis activity will increase. Liver cells will also synthesize glycogen for storage using the excess glucose, so glycogen synthesis activity will increase here as well. And let's go back to insulin. Insulin will trigger insulin-sensitive protein kinase and activate PP1. And this will activate glycogen synthase, and so it's going to trigger glycogen synthesis. And PP1 is going to block the activity of phosphorylase kinase as it converts glycogen phosphorylase to its inactive form, phosphorylase B, and in turn stopping glycogen breakdown. And insulin is going to block GSK3 activity, increasing glycogen synthase activity, therefore activating glycogen synthesis. So that's the high blood glucose state. Let's now take a look at the low blood glucose state. In between meals or during fasting or starvation, blood glucose levels will drop. And when there is low blood glucose levels, this is going to trigger the release of glucagon. So glucagon, glucose is gone. And this is going to activate a series of reactions involving G proteins and triggering the increase of cyclic AMP concentrations, which in turn activates protein kinase A. And protein kinase A phosphorylates phosphorylase kinase, activating glycogen phosphorylase, and therefore activating glycogen breakdown. Now, protein kinase A is also going to phosphorylate glycogen synthase, inactivating it and inhibiting glycogen synthesis. And protein kinase is also going to inactivate pyruvate kinase. So recall that pyruvate kinase is the enzyme that catalyzes phosphorenyl pyruvate to pyruvate. And so we're going to inactivate pyruvate kinase by phosphorylating it. And one last thing, it's also going to inhibit phosphorfructokinase 1, which is an enzyme that's part of glycolysis. So it will inhibit glycolysis. So that is the regulation of glycogen synthesis and degradation. In this lecture, we learned how the key enzymes glycogen synthase and glycogen phosphorylase are allosterically and hormonally regulated. We broke down how carbohydrate metabolism is regulated in liver, taking a look at what pathways are activated and inhibited in high blood glucose state and low blood glucose state. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire metabolism playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating.